No one has ever documented the vicious sting of the panda ant until today. Ah, it's biting me. Ah, ant stinging me. Ah. Deep in the mountains of Chile, there is an insect so rare and so elusive that its sting is completely undocumented by science. And that sting belongs to the panda ant. And today, we're going to try to make history by being the first to find this panda ant, capture it on video, and then of course I will take on the sting of the panda ant in a world's first. This is gonna be like looking for a fuzzy needle in a giant wilderness haystack. It's time to get searching. Now this won't be your average hike. Only a few panda ants have been found in the wild, so we're going to have to search this entire mountain range to even have a chance at finding them. Okay, this looks promising. This open area has a lot of sandy, loose material, which is perfect for the panda ant because it likes to make burrows, and it also allows us to cover a lot of ground fast. Covering ground, that is the name of the game when you're looking for very, very small creatures. The more ground your eyes can scan, the more likely it is you'll find what you're looking for. We're hearing water down below. In the desert, water is life. Let's try our luck in a different environment. Found the water. Ah, it looks so good. If you were ever stuck out here in the desert, this water would be absolutely life-saving and perfectly fine to drink running this fast. A little bouldering. Just seeing water is a boost of energy. Oh, I feel so good. Oh. Oh. It's good that we're seeing these flowers. Panda ants feed on a diet predominantly of nectar. So these flowers, good indication. We have a food source. There's definitely more life down by this river. Finally feels like we're starting to close in on the panda ant. Seeing these smaller wasps, that makes me feel really positive. I think the trail is heating up. I'm starting to see yellow jackets. Good sign for us right now. This is the insect watering hole. But look at that one. See that one that's chasing the others off? It's got like a panda-like abdomen. You seeing this? Abdomen, you seeing this? The male panda ants have wings. Let's keep moving. Have to be getting close. Oh, whoa, look at all these. Just got to this trail and there are all these burrows. I can't say whether or not these are definitively panda ant burrows, but they're the right size and right shape and in the right place. Finally feels like we're starting to close in on the panda ant. Panda ant right there. We got one! Holy, oh, we were literally just about to give up. It's not a big one, but that is a panda ant, baby! Let's go! Yes! Oh. Got one. But our luck wouldn't end there. As we prepped our presentation, and captured the first ever video of this fuzzy little panda, something even more incredible happened. Got another one. Hold on, hold on. Get in there, get in there. Go. They're so fast. So fast, this one's kind of small. I don't want to get stung. Not, uh, not yet, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Two panda ants! Holy cow! And this one really looks like a panda. Wow. Not one, but two panda ants. This is such a rare opportunity to film this world famous creature. There is almost no footage of this species. In fact, this is likely the first 4K footage the world has seen of the panda ant, the world's smallest panda. The 
first thing I noticed about these creatures were their size. They are teeny tiny. Look at the little capsules that we had to bring with us for this presentation. But not only are they small, they are fast. I cannot believe we actually were able to get them into the containers. It's not likely that we're gonna be able to get very much B-roll of them walking around. All it would take is a small little hole or crack in the ground and they are poof, gone. They got their name the panda ant because of that black and white fuzzy exoskeleton, which of course I keep calling them an ant, but they are not an ant at all. They are a species of wasp and the wingless ones are actually females. The males of this species have wings, but the females do not possess wings. But what they do possess is the largest stinger to body size ratio of any insect in the world. They're related to the cow killer found in the Southern United States, another species famous for its massive stinger and painful sting. Both have fuzzy exoskeletons and are classified as velvet ants. However, unlike the cow killer, the effects of the panda ant venom are completely unknown. And with that, it's time to take a closer look at their defense mechanisms. They don't just look like pandas for our amusement. They've developed this coloration to ward off predators to say, hey, I pack a punch. I have a lot of defenses and you will regret it. Now let's talk about another defense mechanism. Let's bring the microphone in there real close. You hear that? That's called stridulation, which is a high frequency warning pitch that these insects are able to emit. And we're not just boosting the sound. This insect's actually noisy. I can hear it. Look at that. Swinging the abdomen already. Might get to see an appearance of that. Oh, that stinger's coming out. Compared to body size, that is a super long stinger. It will have no problem popping a stinger through my skin. Now, remember when I said earlier, this is probably the first 4K footage of a panda ant. Let me also tell you, this is about to be the first ever documented sting of this species. No one has taken a sting of the panda ant. Going into the sting zone with the panda ant is truly the great unknown. I have no idea what kind of reaction I'm going to have. So we brought a couple of emergency remedies. Of course, our satellite phone. If I go into any kind of anaphylactic shock, we will use this for emergency distress calls. In addition to that, I always bring a first aid trauma kit. And in this trauma kit, I always have an EpiPen. That's pretty much our only remedies if this sting gets really bad. For the first time ever, it's time to go flesh the stinger with the panda ant. That stinger is flying. That is a very big stinger. I would say the stinger is the entire length of the lower abdomen. All right, it is time. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the panda ant. Here we go to the great unknown of the world of stings. One, two, three. Ah. Yep, stinger's in, stinger's in. Ah. Ah. Oh, I dropped her. Where'd she go? I don't see her. Definitely stung me. Uh, Maybe over the wall? Yeah, let me see. Uh, they're so fast. And they blend in perfectly. Where she can't have gotten far. Let me look around. Yeah, I'm gonna look over here. All right, yeah, yeah, keep looking, keep looking. Oh no! Oh! Huh, well. Unfortunately, I dropped the ant. She definitely gave me a sting before hightailing it out of here. We've got two distinct sting marks. I would say it's probably similar to that of a hornet, but luckily for us, we have one more ant. In fact, this is the one that looks most like a panda. So it's time to see if the world's smallest panda packs a potent punch. Gotta get a good grip. I know it looks easy, but it is so hard to get a good grip on these tiny little panda ants. There we go. Okay, the stinger's going. One, two, three. Ah! Ooh, yeah, okay. Definitely took a really good sting and a bite. You see this panda's jaws locked into me? Ah, I think this panda ant's bite is worse than its sting. Ah, definitely getting little micro stings. Tiny panda ant just might not be big enough to deliver a full punch. <sighs> okay. Well, you can see here, I got two really good stings 
from the ant that got away. And then I probably have, I don't know, like a dozen little micro stings. I left it there for a while, but there, were, there was one or two really good ones. Oh my God, there it is. Got it. We just found the first panda ant. Wow, I cannot believe it. What am I supposed to do with you? You ran away and now you're back. Should we try to get like another wallop? All right, well, gonna go for another sting. I don't know if I got a full one that first time around. On three. One, two, three. Ah, yep, got me. Ah, bite me. Ah, and stinging me. Got a good one there. Ah. Okay, yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. Really not a remarkable sting, even though we're getting a lot of redness and little micro swelling around those sting sites. This might have been the world's cutest sting. The sting of the tiny panda ant is no match for its growl. All right, let's let this little panda back into the wild. While the pain was manageable right after the sting, the secondary reaction roared back the next day, where I had redness, swelling, and a relentless itch. So while the panda ant might be cute, the sting of this tiny insect should definitely be avoided. Oh, I don't want to take a sting yet. Ah. Here, I got a corner him, I got a corner him. Here we go. All right, here we go, ready? I got him, you guys see a shot? Got it. One, two, three. Ah. Oh, yeah, ah, yeah, they can pinch. They can pinch really good. Ah, he's pinching me. When they pinch you, your first instinct is to let go of that tail. And that's exactly what the scorpion wants. So it can wield that stinger and inflict a painful punch. Ooh, but you just gotta fight through it. Eventually he'll relax and realize he's been caught. But look at the size of that scorpion. That is one serious arachnid. Let's see just how painful the giant hairy scorpion really is. Oh boy, would you take a look at that. Look at the size of that scorpion. And it is time for another sting test, this time with America's largest scorpion, the giant desert hairy. Now we found the scorpion just feet away, right here at our Airbnb in Tucson, Arizona. In fact, check this out. We have a, we have a live studio audience today. Try to keep it down, guys. The giant desert hairy scorpion earns its name because it is truly giant. Most scorpions out here are a fraction of the size of this one. This is a truly huge arachnid with a stinger that is also giant. And this is a species that you would come across. If you lived in Arizona or you're out here adventuring, this is certainly an animal that can end up inside your house. I wanna take a sting today to show you just how severe the sting from this scorpion truly is. And then we will know once and for all whether or not we need to be afraid of this hairy arachnid. We're also going to rank this sting on three factors, intimidation, pain, and aftermath, scoring each from one to 10, and then we will average the total to see where this scorpion rates on the brand new and official Brave Wilderness Bite Sting Index. Boy, it is fired up and aggressive already. Holy cow, look at those pinchers. This scorpion is big enough to actually give you a sizable pinch, so when I first pick it up today, I'm gonna get walloped right off the bat. Now, before I get stung, let's talk about some of the things I brought with me for the test today. I brought with me some sting kill, but I have never used sting kill on any of my sting tests before. So I thought, hey, it's in my pack. Let's give it a shot with today's scorpion sting to see if this sting antidote actually relieves the pain from a scorpion. And then of course, I always bring with me my first aid kit along with my EpiPen. Just in case I have some sort of severe allergic reaction to this venom, the EpiPen will save me in time to get to emergency services. So I always carry an EpiPen never attempt to do what I'm about to do. This is not a good idea. Yes, I think this is going to hurt very badly. Please do not attempt to do what you're about to see. I am definitely nervous. I am always nervous before I take a sting from a species for the first time because until you take the venom firsthand, you never really know how bad it's going to be. So with that, I think it's time to get hands on and release the beast. You guys ready? Got the shot? Okay. Careful. 
helpful. Whoa. Now, I have to grab the scorpion without taking the stone. Man, it's fast. Can we use this platform? Help keep it on the table. All right, so the object here is to not get stung before I'm ready. But in order to tail the scorpion, I need to grab a segment right behind the telson, which is the stinger. And this is a one-shot deal. If you do this wrong, you are getting stung almost instantly. All right, ready? One, two, three. Got him. And then he's going to try to pinch me those big pinchers. Nice! Yeah, he's got his pincher on me there, oh, right under my skin. Now, I have a good grip, and we can talk about how the scorpion feels. Its exoskeleton is very rigid and hard, almost as hard and tough as a crab or a lobster. So I am by no means gonna squish or hurt the scorpion by holding it like this. And yes, those pinchers can give you a wallop of a pinch. Ah, yeah. Mm, one more time for good measure. Now, another kind of interesting thing is the face of the scorpion. You can see it has some eyes right here at the sides, and it has eyes right there in the center, similar to a spider. It gets its name, the giant desert hairy, not only because it's giant in size, but because it's also hairy. You can see the hairs off of all the appendages and you can really see the hairs coming off the tip of the stinger there, you see that? And those hairs help the scorpion sense its environment. This is an arachnid having eight legs related to spiders, but of course it has a much different defense mechanism than a spider. Spiders use fangs to inject venom. Scorpions inject venom with the stinger on their tail. Okay, I think it's time to talk about the business end of the scorpion, the sting of the giant desert hairy is delivered by the tip of the stinger, the telson, which has a venom gland within it that delivers its venom like a hypodermic needle. And this animal uses its sting as a means of defense and predation. This scorpion will be out hunting at night. Once it finds a prey item, which would be other small insects, arachnids, or even a small lizard, it would grapple it with those large pinchers and then inflict a painful sting, subduing its prey so they could be eaten alive. But in this sting test, it will be using its stinger as a defense mechanism against my hand, just like any would-be predator. Okay, it's time to go hand to stinger with America's largest species of scorpion. You guys ready? We're ready, Mark. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to cover the scorpion with my hand, my left hand, and I'm going to release the stinger. When I do that, this scorpion is going to instantly go into defense mode and rapidly sting me with that tail. And I can tell you right now, this scorpion is fired up. It is ready to go. It's pinched me multiple times and it means business. You guys ready for this? I'm looking at the tip of that stinger right now. On three, one, Two, three. Ah, ah, he's pinching me. Ah, go. Ah, oh, oh my God, it's the venom spray. Did you see that? Oh, ah, ah. oh it's stuck there. Oh. Ah, oh, I had to pull the stinger out. It was stuck under my skin, and I got sprayed by venom. Did you guys see that pool of venom? Oh my gosh. Oh, all right here, I gotta put this, I gotta put this back. Oh, oh, oh yeah, that was a full burst. Oh, I definitely got dosed and it burns. You see it's already starting to get red around my knuckle. Mm, it's starting to burn really bad. Hang on. Oh yeah. I cannot believe how much venom just sprayed out of the tail like that. I didn't know it could spray and it does burn. Holy smokes. Yeah, this whole area is a little inferno right there, all around my knuckles. Man, mm, that is so much different than I expected it to be. I expected the stinger to just pop, like whap me. It like scooped up underneath my skin and I had to literally pull the stinger out. Oh man, that burns. Yeah, that burns real good. Okay, 
It's been about five minutes and you can see that I'm definitely getting some swelling going. Uh, we're gonna continue to monitor this sting. But now it's time to officially rank this sting. For an intimidation factor, seeing that huge tail jab me over and over and all that venom spraying out was super intimidating. So I give it an eight out of 10. The pain was somewhere between a hornet and a bee sting. I'd rate it a four out of 10. For the aftermath, it wasn't so bad. The pain afterwards is very manageable, especially after applying some sting kill. So I give it only a three out of 10. Combined, this scorpion rates at a 4.3 on the brand new official Brave Wilderness Bite Sting Index. That is, that is easily the gnarliest sting I have ever taken in terms of seeing the stinger go in and get stuck. I've never had to pull a stinger out like that before. That was wild. But in terms of should we be afraid of this animal, I don't think we should be any more afraid of the giant desert hairy scorpion than we are of your common bee or wasp. What's going on everybody? I'm Mark Vins. Today we're back in Costa Rica for another special adventure brought to you by our friends at B&H Photo. And I'm particularly excited for today's adventure because we are looking for one of my all time favorite land animals, the poison frog. And not just one poison frog, two poison frogs. The strawberry poison frog, and my personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. And the reason I wanna find and present these frogs to you today is because I wanna talk about just how toxic and dangerous these frogs really are. And Mario is gonna give a special demonstration on how we get those really cool macro shots of a small creature like a poison frog. But first things first, we have to find some. Today we're gonna to search just around our lodge here because this whole site is full of bromeliad plants and those are perfect breeding habitats for these species of frogs. So they tend to hang out pretty close by. As a matter of fact, I hear one right now. I'm gonna film on the GoPro, you guys follow me, and with any luck, we're gonna catch two frogs really quickly. Okay, I think what I heard was actually the strawberry poison frog, also called the pomelio. And I heard it coming from right over here. Oh, there he was. I saw him right there. I'm gonna try to not disturb the habitat too much. Ah, this one might have gotten away. So the frogs do have burrows in these masses and they have really great escape routes. They're particularly hard to catch too because they jump with a non-rhythmic motion, which means uh, they don't really have any synchronization at all to the way they hop. That was our first miss, but we did see a strawberry poison frog there. Let's keep looking. We are in the right spot. So these frogs are terrestrial, so what we're looking for are low-hanging branches and leaves that they can find cover around, and that's typically where you find these poison frogs. Oh, got one, got one. There he is. Oh, I fell. Don't move, don't move, it's right here. I'm gonna let it work its way out. I'm gonna go for the grab. Ready, got a shot? Got him. Woo, ha <laughs> ha! All right. Ready for this? Here we go. Strawberry poison frog. We got one. All right, that's part one of two of today's adventure. Next up, the green and black poison frog, which is a little bit more difficult to catch than this one. So for now, let's, uh, let's get a container. I'm going to make a little microhabitat for this frog for a little bit. Some covers so it feels comfortable. There we go. All right, let's go find a green and black poison frog. All right. Good news, bad news. The good news is we caught the first frog we we're after today, the strawberry poison frog, and a really good one too. The bad news is we're in the rainforest and that means sometimes it's gonna rain and there is a rainstorm coming in right now. So we're gonna let this shower pass by. There is a little blessing in disguise. This moisture is probably gonna bring out some of the frogs we're looking for. So all we have to do is wait a little while and then we'll be back at it trying to find the green and black poison frog. All right, taking a quick break. So the rainstorm has passed by, which is good news. Also good news because all of a sudden the rainforest has come to life. We're hearing tons of frogs calling right now. Can you hear that? I can hear about six or seven different species distinctively right now that I wasn't hearing before. So this is a really good sign that we may come across that green and black poison frog a little sooner than we thought. Now the call of the strawberry poison frog is a little more distinct and a little louder. It's like a rip, 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 rip kind of sound. The uh, Green and black poison frog is a duller kind of and it's definitely a lot less audible. So we're gonna have to listen as we search along this edge. So unlike the uh, strawberry poison frog, which I was able to sneak right up on and catch, 
The green and black poison frog is definitely more elusive and shy, so I'm gonna have to be looking a lot further ahead than the other species. I've actually never caught a green and black poison frog myself. So this is a pretty special day for me. This is my absolute favorite species of poison frog. I've been obsessed with these creatures since I was in third grade. Um, and this is really a dream come true to be out here today in Costa Rica, finally getting hands on with one of my favorite animals, if I'm lucky. Okay, nothing here. Let's keep moving this way. Wait a second. I heard one. It's gone. So faint, I heard it for just a second. Let's move over this way. There's one. Where? Big one, right there. It's right here. One. Yep. Oh, I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it. Got him! Ha <laughs> ha! Oh man, all right, I don't wanna lose him. Let's go back over here. This is a big deal. Oh my goodness. Oh, no! Got him, got him, got him, got him, let's get away. Oh man, this is a big moment. My first ever green and black poison frog. Look at that. I have been dreaming of this moment since I was nine years old. Look at how beautiful that frog is. Now we have both poison frogs that we wanna take a closer look at today. Let's put this one in a container and take a look at both species side by side. Coyote's not the only one who bleeds. I bleed blood. That whole bush that I just caught the poison frog in is full of uh, spotty plants. Ouch. Woo, okay. Well, there we have it. Poison frog versus poison frog. We are gonna take a quick look at the differences between these two species before we get into the macro photography. So first things first, it's pretty obvious that we have a size difference here. The strawberry poison frog is more often than not a lot smaller than the green and black poison frog. We can also notice they have very distinct coloration differences. And I have to say, look at how beautiful these two poison frogs are. They truly are the jewels of the rainforest. Now, they don't just look this way to impress us. There's actually a reason why these frogs display the colorations that they do. This is what's called aposomatic coloration, which is a warning sign of predators that says, don't eat me, because if you do, you're gonna eat a whole mouthful of toxins that I have in my skin. Now, we're gonna get to how toxic these two creatures are in just a minute, but before we do, let's talk about a couple other differences in behavior. So they parent in very different ways. The strawberry poison frog, which genus is Ophega, which means egg eater, actually takes their tadpoles once they're hatched out of the egg, deposit them in a small reservoir of water. This can be in a bromeliad plant, this can be in an empty coconut husk, this can be in a hollowed out log. And once the tadpoles are in there, the female will go and deposit unfertilized eggs to feed their offspring. And this is the primary food source for these tadpoles until they reach maturity and become frogs. With the green and black poison frog, their parenting is a little bit different. The male will actually carry the tadpoles on its back to a water reservoir like a bromeliad or a hollowed out log, and they will deposit the tadpoles at different times. Now, because of this, the tadpoles have different stages of maturity, and while they are good parents, they're not the greatest brothers and sisters because these tadpoles, unfortunately, often cannibalize each other for resources because unlike the strawberry poison frog, which feeds on eggs from its parents, the green and black poison frog is completely reliant on its surroundings, so it's gonna eat other insect larvae, algae, and mites that might crawl around the surface. Time to answer the question you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the toxicity of these two poison frogs. Which one is more toxic? The short answer is, it's pretty hard to tell. But for human beings, both of these species are considered, get this, non-threatening. And that's exactly why I'm able to hold both of these and present them for you here today. All I need to do after this presentation is wash my hands with soap and water, and I'm going to be just fine. Now, that being said, there are varieties of poison frogs in South America that are potentially dangerous and even deadly to human beings. And we're actually gonna be going on a trip to Colombia later this year to try to find some of those. So while neither of these frogs are potentially threatening to human beings, they are both very toxic for their would-be predators. So I think we've taken a pretty good look at both of these little gems of the rainforest. And now it's time for Mario to step in and show us some of the cool tricks of the trade and how we get those awesome macro shots with some of our specialty lenses. Mario, you ready to step in? All right, let's do it. Okay, cool. Okay, so we had to make a quick move there because the sun started to come out. And uh, believe it or not, despite being toxic, 
These frogs are actually very, very fragile. So for the well-being of the frog, we wanted to move to the shade. And that being said, Mario, how do we get these macro shots? We're gonna be using this setup right here, which is the new Canon EOS R and our favorite lens, the macro 100 millimeter Canon L series. So in order to get these really tight shots, uh, a few things have to be in our favor, light and stability. So we like to use a nice sturdy tripod in order to get the stability we need in low light conditions. One of the reasons why we really love this 100 mil macro lens is because of its amazing image stabilization. A lot of times we may not have the most heavy duty tripod and we have to use lightweight gear. So that extra image stabilization is critical. So I'm gonna start recording. We've got this dual pixel autofocus, which means any little movement will actually be tracked. Now, unfortunately there is some movement in just holding this animal. It is very hard to keep still, but as you can see, we're already achieving that really fine detail that macro photography actually will allow. So how am I doing? Am I staying steady enough for you? You're pretty steady, but I think we are done with this guy. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to the green and black. Okay, cool. Now time for the all-star. My personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. Man, nine-year-old Mark would be very, very pleased with how today's going. In, in the world of macro, uh, we went from the little strawberry dart frog to this one. Mm -hmm. This is bigger. So now I have to actually adjust a little bit, at least for the distance. Uh, we want to get kind of its entire body in frame. That blue shirt with this contrast of the green and black looks really nice. Thank you, Mario. I'll take that as a compliment. It's amazing you could actually see its respiration. Beautiful. So macro photography is definitely a team effort, especially in a situation like this where you have one person holding a specimen and one person getting the video. Great thing about these cameras, of course, is you could also get your still images from them. Okay, got both frogs back in hand. Mario, you ready to get the thumbnail? Yeah. And since this episode is a comparison of two of our favorite species of poison frog, we're gonna do a head-to-head -head comparison for the thumbnail. Let's, let's get a green background. Man, what an awesome day. Catching a strawberry poison frog is always a great day, but I have to say for myself, finding and catching my very first green and black poison frog was truly a special moment. So thank you for being here, Mario. That was Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. And I do want to say a special thank you to b &H Photo for sponsoring this adventure. And here's some good news. They put together some awesome gear and deal packages just for our audience. So if you go to www.bhphoto.com forward slash brave right now, you can take advantage of those deal offerings and get outside and make videos like we do. All right, let's let them go. I'm going to attempt to use this little stick to try to get a bulldog ant for our sting test. All right, got our forceps, small container. Now we just need the bulldog ant itself. I'm going to lightly disturb the entryway. Oh, here we go, got them already. That makes me nervous. The ants are starting to swarm. You see how big they are? This is like a volcano of ants. Oh, gosh, it's got me. They're getting on me. All right, I'm gonna have to get our ant fast. Here we go. I got it. Yes. Oh, man. Oh, there we go. We've got one. That is a really good size bulldog ant. Starting to swarm a little too much to hang out here. Let's go reposition away from the nest so we can get a closer look at one of the scariest ants in the world. Australians fear these massive ants because they attack in swarms and without warning. If you accidentally disturb them, you can be covered in just a matter of seconds. Bulldog ants can be found all over Australia and often build nests in people's yards and local parks, which is exactly where we discovered these ants. This particular species is one of the largest, growing to over one inch in length. And of course, for this sting test, we wanted the big dogs, so we could compare how they rank against the legendary bullet ants of South and Central America. Now it's time to find out which is worse. All right, guys, it is officially go time with the bulldog ant. Look at the size of this insect. Size-wise, I would definitely say it gives the bullet ant a run for its money, but appearance, this ant is second to none when it comes to intimidation factor. But before I test the might of this insect, let's get it out of the container and take an even closer look at those jaws and its stinger. All right, here we go. Oh, it's already jumping out. I wanna be very careful right now. And they are so aggressive. Look at that, it's already biting on the forceps. I'm just gonna try my best to get a good grip 
and I'm getting nervous. Gosh, hang on. All right, I gotta get it on the ground. Here we go. Unlike other ants, they don't really react to scents and pheromones, they react to sight. So anytime I try to grab it with the forceps, it sees that I'm coming. There we go. Okay, perfect hold. There it is. No animal has been requested for a sting test more than the bulldog ant in the history of Brave Wilderness. And now I can see why. Wow, I have never seen a more terrifying looking ant in my entire life. Let's start at the top. Look at the size of those mandibles. They are like serrated shears attached to these bulbous eyes, almost like a vice grip, just ready to snap and pinch on to anything it can touch. Look at the eyes of the ant. You can really see how much it reacts by using its sight. Look how it turns its head to the different ways that I position my finger around it. And then, of course, before we get to the stinger, I just have to say, look at the size of those legs. Because they are visually stimulated, they use their extremely long legs to extend quickly and flip themselves onto any would-be predator, earning them the name jumping jacks. And then, of course, we can see the stinger flying already from the abdomen. Like other stinging insects, only the females can sting. This is actually a century or a soldier ant tasked with guarding the front of the nest. And you saw with just the slightest disruption, a fleet of soldiers came flying out of the nest ready for attack. They got all over my boots and nearly took a sting right away, but we saved the sting for this moment in the video. The sting of this ant is said to be one of the most painful experiences that you can get from any animal here on the continent of Australia. Some even argue in the world. The biggest difference between bullet and bulldog ant stings are the toxins they use. Bullet ants use a Panera toxin, which is slow building and can last for days, where bulldog ants use formic acid that causes instant pain. And when these ants swarm and cover people by the dozens, they have the ability to take down a fully grown adult. Holy cow, she's looking at me. Oh my gosh, look at that stinger go. I have a feeling this is going to hurt. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with one of the most terrifying ants on the planet, the Australian Bulldog Ant. On three, one, two, three. goodness yeah that burns that is a super super intense sting oh my gosh okay hang on let me compose myself oh oh man that was like instant fire underneath my skin so much more like potent than the bullet ant but I could tell you this the bite was really nothing. Didn't really get a good grip on with those jaws, but it certainly got its stinger stuck in my arm and it whew, getting a little dry now. Hang on, my adrenaline's kicking in. You okay, Mark? Yeah, I'm all right, I think. Uh, all right. Jeez, it's also hot out all of a sudden. All right. I think I'm good to continue on. All right. Oh, you bulldog. Oh, all right. See that stinger sight? Got a little bit of a acute swelling, maybe some residual bumps, and it definitely burns. I would say the initial onset of the sting, it was like a lightning bolt, way more intense than a bullet ant. But and I can tell you it's already starting to subside a bit. But wow, that is a rip shot of pain. Man. 
<clears throat> really getting dry mouth, guys. The, uh, is your EpiPen in your backpack? It, it is. I've got my EpiPen. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't need it yet, but got to monitor my, make sure my tongue's not swelling up or anything. But holy cow, that sting is like a hammer. It's like somebody literally just took a hammer and went wham. Instantaneous pain. Not even a small delay. As soon as the stinger touched my skin, boom, it was on. Oh, I hope you enjoyed that one because I don't think I want to go arm to stinger again with that intimidating little ant. Now I am not out of the woods by any means. I'm gonna to continue to monitor this thing over the next two days. I can tell you this, a single sting from a bulldog ant so far does not compete with the bullet ant. Unlike the bullet ant that just started to build and build and build, I'm starting to really get past that initial wave of pain. And now I'm just really more dealing with the, uh, the after effects of adrenaline, starting to get that like queasy stomach, cold sweat, and just simple nausea that I usually get after taking a sting. But a swarm of bulldog ants, I would estimate could take even the most pain tolerant person to their knees. All right, I think I'm gonna need some ice. Oh, sure enough, things got a lot worse. Just hours later, the redness and inflammation flared up and were joined by an intense itching that lasted for several days. Compared to other stings I've taken, this one was a sleeper that turned into a monster. Bulldog ant stings are known for their instant pain, so I was shocked when I was hit with these delayed reactions. While I did not experience the 24 hours of deep bone break pain that the bullet ant gave me. Ah! Oh! Oh, that hurts! Ooh, oh, that is searing pain. This was far from an ordinary walk in the park. In fact, as of the editing of this video, my arm is still discolored and healing. If I were to have been swarm and stung like the stick in the beginning of the video, it would have been a very bad situation. But now I know exactly why Australians go so far out of their way to avoid the jumping tear that is the bulldog ant. Yikes. We are in the outback of Western Australia, looking for a truly bizarre creature. And it's covered in razor sharp spines. Let's just say catching this one, it's gonna hurt a little. This creature is just as shy as it is sharp. So first we have to track one down in this huge forest, which also happens to be home to another one of the rarest and most endangered animals on the planet that we're also trying to find by the end of this video. But in order to catch this giant spike ball, we're going to need to look for clues. <sighs> Oh yeah, right there, check that out. This is a termite nest. This will be a perfect feast for the creature that we're after today. That tells me we are on the right track. Let's keep searching. Our second clue is that these creatures love to hide near trees and stumps. So that's where we're spending the most time looking. The problem is this forest is full of hiding places. This is like looking for a needle or a big pile of needles in a giant haystack. After hours of searching, we got lucky with the discovery of a final clue. That is a good sign right there. That's some poop from the creature we're after. You can see all the ants and termites in here. That means we're getting close. Oh, right there. That's an echidna. Look at that. Ho oh, ho! Yes! That is what we have been looking for all morning long. That is Australia's spikiest creature, the echidna. And it is yeah, wow, that is sharp. Okay, the echidna from the top is a tank riddled with spikes and a super tough skin. But underneath the echidna is a soft belly. And I'm gonna try to work my hand underneath this animal so I can present it to you. This is probably going to be a challenge. Let's see if I get my hand underneath. Ready? Ah, come here, buddy. It's okay. And he's just wriggling in there. Ah! Oh, he's spiked. Ah, he's getting me. Mm. Now, unlike a porcupine, their spines can't release, but they are super sharp nonetheless. Ow! Okay. Okay, he's really wedged in there, guys. This is gonna be tough. Ah! Mm. Yeah, getting nailed. 
All right, I'm gonna have to use some gloves here. There's no way I'm gonna be able to pry out this echidna. It is basically puffing up its body, using its spikes to wedge itself into this stump of the tree. All right, here we go. Luckily, I always carry a good pair of gloves with me on every adventure. I wanna get to the underside of the echidna that is much softer, and that should allow me to hold it for the scene. But I'm gonna have to do this really carefully. I'm trying to like work under all of the different spines. There we go. Uh-huh. Okay, now these spines are nothing more than modified hair, so this isn't hurting the echidna at all. It's only hurting me. Ah! Oh, you're sharp. Ow! Poked right through the glove. Okay, I've got the underside. I've got the underside. This is good. Okay. I think I feel his foot. Ow! Oh gosh, you are really ah! get spined so bad. All right, I'm underneath him. I'm underneath him. This is good. Run the underbelly so much easier to contend with. All right, right. Got him. Got him. I've got the echidna. We got one, guys. That is the echidna. Hello. All right, let's go this way. I see an opening over here. This will be perfect. So I think for the echidna to be most comfortable, it's going to mean a little discomfort for me. I'm going to attempt to take my gloves off to do this scene, not only in hopes that the echidna will be more comfortable and will show us that beak, but also as to show everyone why you should never pick up an echidna. Oh boy. Hello. <laughs> this animal likes to hide by wedging against the nearest object. In this case, it's my foot. Now I get to the soft belly part. <laughs> oh, so sharp. Back in here. Every time I try to pick him up, his spikes break under the skin of my fingernails. Come on, come on, come on, Knuckles. Anybody who is a fan of the Sonic the Hedgehog video game definitely knows Knuckles the Echidna. And you are tough as nails, Knuckles. Yeah. Hey, buddy, I'm gonna put you on my knee, if that's okay. It's going through my pants. Oh my gosh, it's so sharp. Okay, hi. You are the spikiest creature I have ever held with my bare hands. Oh my goodness. Okay, this animal from the top side is almost bulletproof from any predator. Not only does it have these sharp spines, but the top hide is very tough. Now, on the underside of the echidna, <laughs> on the underside of the echidna, there's very soft underbelly along with its face. Hopefully this echidna will get comfortable enough with me today to show its little face because it is super adorable. I'm trying to make it as comfortable as I can. Ah, as discomforting as it is for me, I wanna show you that adorable little beak, the face of the echidna. Come on, buddy. I'm just gonna hold it here and try to be silent. Try to be silent! Ah. Oh my gosh, ah, he's poking his nose at me. Come on, come out, say hi. Ah. Oh, I think we're gonna have an appearance of the kidna beak. Hi, hello, come say hi. Oh, I can see the eyeball, come say hi. Ah. No, 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 that's a no. Door slammed. There we go. Get a shot. Show us your cute little mug. <sighs> Try to be quiet. Fight through the pain. Because I want you to see the face of the echidna. Come out. Come out and show us. Show us the face. Ah. Ah. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Can you see it? Mm. Mm. Guys, get the shot, get the shot. Ah, 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 ah. Ah, 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 ah. Hi, hi, how are you? I'm not doing good. I hope you're doing well though. All right guys, that is the beak of the echidna. And it has been very painful to get on camera. Ah, you little, you little, you little spike ball. Ah. 
Ah. Okay, okay. So you can see the boogery nose there. These animals just recently were discovered to be able to regulate their body heat by blowing snot bubbles on their nose. Oh man. Okay. Just gotta work through the pain a little bit. So an echidna feasts on a diet made up completely of ants and termites. In fact, this animal also has some of the best hearing of any animal in Australia, and it's so sophisticated, they can actually hear the termites and the ants crawling underground, which is why we have to be so quiet. Ah, it's so sharp. It is so sharp. And now, compared to the hedgehog, an echidna weighs a lot more. I would say this echidna is in excess of 10 pounds. And just the weight alone. Oh, makes it super sharp and its spines. Ah, its spines are so sharp, guys. Okay. Ah. Now, if you get a shot of that foot, you'll notice that it's actually backwards. That is a very unusual trait. A lot of times when people are tracking echidnas, they will actually follow them the opposite direction because of the fact that those hind feet are flipped in the opposite direction. These animals have long claws on the back of their feet that are primed for digging, and the echidna has the ability to dig in. And a lot of times when you see these in the environment, they are literally just a ball of spikes. In fact, the only predator that really targets the echidna here in Australia is the feral invasive fox. They'll actually pee on the back of these animals and get them to flip over to expose that soft underbelly. From the top, the echidna is almost bulletproof. From underneath, they're a little teddy bear. And that's why it curls up into a ball, just like this. All right. Look at that face. Ow, you hurt me. You hurt me so. Ugh. Okay, okay, put him down, put him down. Ah, ah, ah. Definitely drew some blood. That is like wildlife acupuncture. I do not recommend it. It's time to put our echidna back where we found it. And honestly, I'm not sure who's happier about this. Me or the echidna. My hands are on fire right now. Ouch. With the echidna safely back in its tree and my hands throbbing in pain, it's now time to track down one of the rarest animals on the planet, the numbat, one of the last living relatives of the now extinct Tasmanian tiger. Most of the remaining numbats in the world live in Dryandra National Park, but Dryandra is completely surrounded by farmland, trapping the numbats inside. This forest is really the last place we can find them. Spotting one is going to be really challenging because they blend into the landscape perfectly. Luckily, just like the echidna, numbats feed on termites, so we know we're on the right trail. We searched the forest really hard for over six hours without a sign of anything. It was a ghost town. But just when I was thinking about giving up for the day, I noticed something furry running through the bushes. Oh my gosh, that's him. Oh my God. There he is. I found one. I got him. I'm filming a numbat. He's looking right at me. Oh, I can't believe it. Wow. This is one of the last numbats on the planet. Numbats are a critically endangered species with less than 1,000 left in the wild. Places like Dryantra National Park in Australia are so important in protecting species like this from going extinct. And that's why it's important that this forest remains standing. This has to be one of the rarest animals I've ever filmed. What's he, what's he doing now? What's he doing? No. Is he trying to crawl inside? No way. Never gonna fit. Ha! Huh. Look at his little legs go. He can barely fit. Is he gonna make it? Oh! Oh! <laughs> and there he goes. Right now, I am out tide pulling in Eastern Australia in search of the deadliest creature on the planet. The Blue Ring Octopus has one of the most toxic venoms on Earth. And if we're lucky enough to find one, I'm going to attempt to touch it with my bare hands. But first things first, let's get looking. From experience tide pooling, the best results are usually from the edge. The further out you can go, the better. An octopus can change the texture of its skin and it would just look like any of these. 
Now I've struck out on all three previous occasions trying to locate a blue ring octopus. I'm hoping fourth time's a charm. The difference this time is I'm searching with my good friend Miller Wilson, who has seen blue rings in these tide pools before. It's very hard to pick a octopus that's a master of camouflage out from this environment. It's about to be low tide, and this is probably one of the most dangerous tide pools that I have ever searched. So wearing some nice protective shoes, gloves. I don't really want to handle the octopus, but the gloves should protect me just in case. And of course, we still need to watch our steps because if you look at this, all these rocks out here, exactly like a stonefish. And this is stonefish territory. The stonefish is the world's most venomous fish. If you step on one, your boots will not protect you. A single sting from a stonefish can be excruciating and can even be deadly. No octopus. Flipping's not really doing it. So I'm just gonna cruise to cover a lot of ground, looking for movement. A lot of times I do see octopus moving from pocket to pocket, but they slink along the surface. So I'm just looking for any movement right now. Any movement, we're getting it though, feel it. Oh my God, I got an octopus. I got a blue ring, guys. It's right here. There it is. I missed it. It's right in here. It's right here. How could I miss that? That was it. Got it. Oh my gosh. We got one. Are you kidding me? Yes. Boom, baby. Boom. Yes! Holy cow. Miller, we're good. We got one. Can you help me get out of the net? So you'll see I'm wearing gloves, guys, for a reason right now. This is, this is a really good way to get a nip. That is not what I want. Put that guy in there. Hello. There we go. Hey, buddy. Let's talk about what we found. Right there in my hand, is the most dangerous animal on the planet, at least when it comes to venom. Nothing in the animal kingdom is more toxic than this tiny little octopus. And yes, I am nervous about it, but before the end of this video, I will officially touch with my bare hand the most dangerous and toxic creature on Earth. There are actually four described varieties of blue ring octopus. This one, is the blue lined octopus. It's the only one in the family that has these really cool, vivid blue pinstripes surrounding the body. It's almost like blue tiger stripes. So if this animal is at all threatened here, I wanna show you what it does. See that? Look at those rings go. Is that cool or what? Oh, 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 okay. Stay down, stay down. If the octopus is at all agitated, not only does it flare up the rings on its arms, but those lines on its body glow. <laughs> Back up, I'm toxic. That's your abosomatic warning. And if you don't listen to me, I'm gonna give you a nip. And they show these vivid display warnings, not only for predators, but they also do it while they're hunting. They will do it to confuse or startle their would-be prey. This is what our octopus friend here is out hunting. This is a type of shore crab, but this would be the perfect food for the octopus. All right, we're gonna let this crab go. A single bite from this octopus could kill over 20 human beings. Needless to say, if I get nipped by this creature, that'll be the last nip I ever take. Now these octopus are nocturnal and they are masters of camouflage. Its normal color pattern perfectly blends in to this silty environment. They have three hearts that pump blue blood. They also have nine brains. One central brain to run the entire nervous system, but then at the base of each arm, they have another brain. And you can see there that little beak holds two venom sacs. And it's actually a toxin that it doesn't even produce itself. And it actually picks up through bacteria that it finds in the environment. 
through other organisms in this tide pool, and it collects this bacteria in its saliva glands, and when it uses its beak to bite into its prey, or a predator for escape, it will actually inject saliva into the wound. Once this saliva enters the bloodstream, you get infected with TTX. No animal has as lethal of a dose as the blue ring octopus does. If you get even a micro amount of TTX in your bloodstream, all you can do is be put on life support and hope that eventually your body works through the toxin on its own. And here's the worst part about it. While you might be in complete paralysis, you are lucid. There are survivors that have lived to tell the tale of having people try to resuscitate them, giving active CPR, and they weren't able to communicate, but they remember everything. And a lot of people get bitten by these octopus because of mistaken identity. You'll come out to a local beach and tide pool. Guys, turn your cameras right now. This is an active beach. People take their dogs and kids and play on this beach, and these animals live all along the coastline. Now, that's not to scare you. Obviously, we're out here actively looking for them. They're hard to find, but people do unfortunately come into contact with these octopus and they will pick them up, play with them, and in that process, take a bite, which is completely painless, by the way. Initial symptoms are going to be things like tingling, difficulty breathing, difficulty thinking, loss of your motor skills, wobbly walking. If you think you are ever bitten by a blue ring octopus and you start to have symptoms, you have to be rushed to the hospital fast as you can. We're talking like life flight situation because you only have a matter of minutes before your whole nervous system starts to shut down and you're no longer able to breathe. Whew. And saying all that while holding the octopus in your hand, it's hard to remember the last time I was this nervous in the presence of an animal. All right, the time has come Whew. for something that I've thought a lot about because I know the only way that this octopus has the ability to envenomate you is a bite with its beak. I'm going to attempt to touch with my bare hand the most lethal toxic animal on the planet. In order to do that, I'm gonna just dump out this water. Look at that. The octopus is trying to mimic the color of the cube. Rest assured, this is just a camouflage tactic. They are masters at this. That octopus is still very much able to pounce and bite they can spend extended periods out of water. All right, so just so you guys know, uh, if this blue ring does snare me, we're going to the hospital on three. One, two, three. That made me nervous. All right, lid back on. I don't think I was just bitten now, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. I had to take a break, guys, because like I'm definitely feeling a little lightheaded, like major anxiety. That animal right there, if you get bit, it's game over. It's lights out. Guys, I am like shaking right now. Like my feet are tingling. Things that you normally wouldn't pick up on, like heart rate, how I'm breathing tingle feeling I got just from like all the adrenaline pumping through my body um, and the the emotions are intense super intense <sighs> gotta shake that off the anxiety that I'm experiencing on camera is real as I had almost identical symptoms to that of a blue ring bite while I was 99% sure I wasn't bitten we had to closely monitor my symptoms until we deemed it safe enough to continue filming the symptoms of these bites can be subtle and can be hard to differentiate from anxiety and panic from other sources of stress. Please, never attempt to do what you are seeing in this video. I cannot stress enough, if you are bitten by a blue ring octopus, you must seek medical attention immediately. I think I'm all right, I think I'm okay to continue, let's keep going. Okay, I, it's been a while since I've had this kind of reaction to being in an encounter with an animal. Like it's like my first time seeing a venomous snake. It's like whew, all kinds of emotions right now just brushing up against one in the tide pool while you're walking around, if you accidentally touch one, you're gonna be just fine. It's like every other octopus. The difference only occurs when you take a bite from the beak right there. What's going on everybody? And welcome back to another Blue Wilderness Adventure here on the edge of the Caribbean Sea at night. 
Now we're at Grand Cayman Island and we did come here to swim at Stingrays at Stingray City. And that was awesome. We saw all kinds of cool reef fish and of course got up close and personal with those giant rays. But if we truly want to see something unique, something really bizarre, the best time to do that is at night. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our dive gear ready, head out into the darkness of the sea, and get up close with some of the most alien looking creatures you can imagine. Before we could make our descent, we had to swim away from shore out to deeper water. The visibility along the way was poor and churned up by the waves, making this process much more nerve-wracking than usual. Plunging into dark water is without question disorienting. And it isn't until you regain your visibility and bearings that your instincts to turn back retreat and allow you to press forward further into darkness. My eyes struggled to scan the empty space around me for a glimpse of anything. But just like that, we have our first visitor. Drawn in by my camera lights, I find these Caribbean reef squids stunning and very interesting to observe. Oddly enough, it actually might be as equally interested in me. They can be quite the characters and are extremely intelligent. It's mesmerizing how its bright coloration and translucent skin glimmer as it flutters its fins against the dark, inky water. Isn't it incredible how it can remain in perfect position with so little effort? Closely related to octopus and cuttlefish, these torpedo-shaped cephalopods have 10 appendages set in front of two very large, complex eyes. And while Caribbean reef squid are normally social creatures, seeing one all alone isn't that uncommon. Wow, they really are something. What an interesting creature to kick off tonight's dive. It's a surreal sensation to descend into the black abyss of the ocean at night. Some would argue this scenario would easily rank as their greatest fear. And I wouldn't necessarily blame them. Your first night dive can be scary. Luckily, our camera lights are strong and almost create a force field, literally pushing back the fear of the unknown and establishing the reality that exists in front of us. I learned long ago that a strong sense of curiosity can be the best defense against any fear. Curiosity, like our dive lights, can illuminate our minds to focus on what we can see instead of imagining what figments may exist beyond the shadows. And in this world, almost anything my light touches brings my curiosity to a boil. The weightlessness of diving combined with this foreign landscape feels like nothing less than a space odyssey. So in the spirit of worlds beyond our imagination, tonight we are on the hunt for something truly bizarre, as I hope to encounter the aliens of the reef. Between the maze of shapes and spectrum of vivid colors that make up the coral reef, its inhabitants are equally as colorful and unusual. And as I get closer to the reef, many of the smaller creatures start to reveal themselves, like this arrow crab. As are most of its other crab cousins, this one is an opportunistic feeder hunting for worms and other easy prey items. But if that doesn't look like an alien, I'm not sure what does. Okay, let's move on and see what we can find on the other side of the reef. Oh wow! So in complete contrast to the arrow crab, here we have a huge reef spider crab, also known as a channel clinging crab. This species of spider crab are commonly found in waters off of Florida, the Bahamas, and various Caribbean islands, but this one is by far the largest I've seen. We're currently at about 60 feet below the surface, but these crabs can actually be found, get this, in excess of 100 feet, a depth we don't often explore for marine life but maybe we should search for some deep water creatures on a future dive. The walls of the reef are really impressive. 
covered in brightly colored sponges that tower up at steep angles, giving way to flatter coral beds. Wait, what was that? I heard a crunch, like some sort of popping sound. Whoa, that's what I heard. That grunt just smashed that smaller f Oh, and look at that, there's an octopus. Did you see it before it changed color? That's a Caribbean reef octopus, and a big one too. This is definitely the all-star creature of the night. Now they can be extremely difficult to find, but once spotted, will flicker with color. And these color displays are remarkable. It's both attempting to blend in with the reef to camouflage itself, and just when I get close enough, does that. That is a defensive display. See it flash white and blue and balloon up to appear larger than it really is? It's incredible how adaptive these creatures are. Not only able to change color, but also able to change their shape and skin texture completely. Seeing these behaviors is very rare. This is actually the first time I've ever witnessed it. Now let's talk about danger. All octopus are venomous, including this one, and use their beaks to inject their prey with a toxic saliva that paralyzes them while they're consumed. However, unlike their smaller cousin, the blue ring octopus, this species does not have a lethal bite when it comes to humans. But besides their venomous ways and bizarre appearance, these animals are indeed strange, having three hearts, 360 degree vision, and possessing inexplicable intelligence has some scientists suggesting that these creatures are indeed aliens from another world. In fact, there are few fossil records to suggest otherwise, but we'll save that debate for another video. Okay, well our computers are telling us it's time to return back to the surface, but what an epic way to end our adventure. For more photos and videos of this dive, make sure to follow me on Instagram, at RealMarkVins, and I do respond to questions, so make sure to comment and ask away. Wow, that was by far the biggest octopus I've personally ever seen out here in the Caribbean, and by far the biggest one we've ever featured on this channel, and it showed us all kinds of crazy displays. I mean, it changed color a dozen times. It went from blues to reds to oranges to stripes, and then it had those brilliant dominance displays where it ballooned up and tried to make itself look bigger on the reef. That was incredible. I cannot believe we just witnessed that. And how about that Caribbean reef squid? That's nothing to shake a stick at either. That was pretty awesome to see the bioluminescence cascading up and down its fins. And I hope everybody at home enjoyed tonight's night adventure just as much as we did. The crew and I are absolutely exhausted. We're gonna get this gear off and head back home for the evening. While a person's first night dive can be a frightening ordeal, I have found that any journey through this mystical landscape will quickly replace feelings of fear with pure excitement. These days, whenever I have the chance to dive at night, I find myself jumping at the opportunity, literally just as long as my light batteries are fully charged. Deep in the heart of the Caribbean Sea, on one of its many craggy islands, lives a lizard that has been brought back from the brink of extinction and now roams this tropical landscape by the hundreds. That island is Grand Cayman, and that lizard is none other than the blue iguana. And while an iguana might not immediately strike you as being unique or noteworthy, I assure you this one absolutely is because it's blue, very blue, making it one of the most beautiful and rarest iguanas on the planet. Now to put things in perspective, these lizards dwindled all the way down to an estimated 15 total individuals in the wild, making them functionally extinct which is where our friend Fred Burton steps in. Directly responsible for creating the Blue Iguana Recovery Program, Fred has offered us the unique opportunity to get up close with these endangered reptiles and toward the facility he started 15 years ago. Right now, what we're doing is we're trying to find one of the resident blue iguanas that's habituated to humans. His name is Peter, and apparently he's big and friendly and a great ambassador for his species. So we're trying to get close to Peter try to get the GoPro up close, try to get the cameras up close so you can see why this is such a unique lizard species. So Peter's on his favorite rock. Oh, is this Peter here? Look at him, yes. Now that is an impressive iguana. All right, guys, let's uh, come in Peter's enclosure here. Wow, look at that. Let's get a shot of Peter 
before we approach, just in case he wants to hop off that rock, because that is a great display of a blue iguana right there. Yeah, this is a unique species. It's only found in Grand Cayman. Okay, yeah. so the blue iguana is endemic to the Cayman Islands, and it is a species of rock iguana. We've seen rock iguanas in the past, but I have never seen one this color. I mean, and you're telling me that these blue iguanas get even more blue than this. When they're in the breeding season, yeah. He's kind wow. of dull right now. Really? Um, when he gets hot I and excited. Dull. I think you look great. And in March and April, when he's courting the girls, mm -hmm. he's, he, he will blaze blue. Um, really, really, really bright. Hi, Peter. Are we buddies? Are we gonna be pals? I think so. So Fred, tell us a little bit about Peter. How did he come to the uh, program and why is he so friendly? He's an interesting case because we were just walking around out in the open there a good many years ago. And we saw a young two-year-old just on the gravel. And we thought, where did he come from? Figured it must have been one of the free roaming iguanas had laid and hatched and whatnot. But we start thinking, okay, we better catch it so we can get a blood sample and do the genetics and all this thing. So we're creeping up to this thing and it's just looking at us. It's not afraid, yeah. you know? And we just walk up to this iguana and pick him up and he doesn't run away. And he's been like that ever since. He's, he, he, it's like he was born without the fear gene. You know, he wow. just, he doesn't, he has no natural reaction to Friendly humans. since day one. I like it. So Peter's turning more blue because he's warming up to us. Is that what this is? He likes the attention, yeah. All right. Well, who doesn't like a good head scratch? So quick little uh, disclaimer to everybody at home. Don't go up to a wild iguana and pet it. This is uh, not uh, a normal iguana. This Definitely. is an iguana that has been habituated to humans and is used to this kind of interaction and is why we are able to get so close to Peter today. If you try to do this to a wild rock iguana, you're gonna get bit. And if you look here at Peter's mandibles, they have quite the powerful bite, and they also have a couple rows of razor sharp teeth. So you definitely do not want to get your finger or your hand caught in the jaws of a wild rock iguana. So best to leave them alone and give them their safe distance. But man, are they cool. So these, um, these beads, we put on every iguana we release, and we also put them on the captive iguanas in case they get out. Mm. And the idea is the combination of bead sizes and bead colors is unique to each animal. So that, uh, you know, if we're walking around the park and we see an iguana and we want to know who that is, all we need to do is train binoculars on the beads, look them up in the database, and we'll know exactly who we're dealing with. But the other thing I we do... Peter's sleeping. The other thing <laughs> we do is we photograph the sides and the top of his head. Mm -hmm. And these big and large scales, if you look at the scales on his snout here, they're all a little bit irregular. Right, they don't, they're not perfectly symmetrical. Okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. every iguana has a slightly different scale pattern. It's like a fingerprint. So we got pictures of this guy, and if this guy turned up somewhere he didn't want to be, and the pit tag was gone and the bead tag was gone, we'd still be able to match the photograph and say, that is that iguana. That is Peter. That is Peter. But just judge on how we're able to approach Peter, I don't think it would take very long to figure out who it was. <laughs> So one of the other cool things about rock iguanas generally are the toes. Okay. So this is like a, a hook. Looks like a talon to me. So they can, they, they're quite good at climbing trees. Mm -hmm. They don't, they, you know, they spend most of the time on the ground, but they're quite good at climbing trees. And these, these, these claws hang onto things really effectively. And for females digging nests, of course, they're great for digging too. But the, the weird thing is, you know how our hands bend like this? These guys bend like this. Oh, they bend right to left. They don't bend this way. They don't bend this way, but they bend backwards. That is very interesting, Peter. And think about why, because right there, they're constantly pulling this thing through vegetation. And now, Fred, is there any other distinct characteristic about the blue iguana that's worth noting today? I like to mention this little thing here. Okay. You see that little scale there? It looks translucent. I do. So that's the pineal eye. Mm -hmm. And that's a very primitive feature in reptiles, but these aren't primitive animals. Right. Um, light can get through there. And we think that there is a brain receptor in there. And they probably, we don't know this for sure, but we suspect that they use this for tracking day length. And that's how they subconsciously know what time of year it is and the triggers for when they need to start thinking about breeding season and all that sort of thing. Very unique sensory mechanism. Very yeah. cool, Peter. A lot of the stuff that I've described to you is useful because what we need always is for people to relate to these animals. If we want to conserve an animal like this, 
people need to be engaged in it, right? right? And the thing about an animal like this is it's, it's, it, it responds to us in a way. We can, we can understand it, we can empathize. So knowing about the iguanas helps us tell stories about them. And we tell stories about these iguanas and people start to love them. And if people start to love them, they want us to preserve them. And that's, that's the way it all works. Well, I think Peter has done a phenomenal job today hanging out with us so we can learn more about his species. And as far as lovability, I mean, I think the proof is right here, guys. This is about the coolest customer I've ever witnessed when it comes to an iguana. Thank you very much for hanging out, Peter. And thank you, Fred. Really appreciate the tour of the facility. Great work on bringing back this population of beautiful reptiles. Without the efforts put in place by Fred and now sustained by the National Trust's Blue Iguana Recovery Program, these lizards would almost certainly no longer exist in the wild. What they have done for the blue iguana is truly remarkable and always makes us proud to tell one of these heroic efforts to save such a special creature. If you would like to catch a glimpse of the famous blue iguana for yourself, drop by the Queen Elizabeth II Botanic Gardens website to book a tour with the Blue Iguana Recovery Program, where you can get up close with this endemic species and if you're lucky enough, may even get to meet Peter himself. But just don't disturb him if he's resting. The star of the island needs his beauty sleep. Hey everybody, I'm Mark Vins and welcome back to another special adventure brought to you by B&H Photo. Tonight, we are going out in the jungle looking for a ghost. No, not a paranormal ghost, a living ghost, one that we will actually find if we can locate its habitat. This animal loves moving water. So in order to find out where we need to hike tonight, we need to use the light of day and our drone to see where the stream systems exist on this property. First things first, before we can fly the drone, we've got to set it up. And today we are flying the DJI Mavic 2 Pro. This is a really awesome drone, but for us today, it's more of a reconnaissance tool so we can see the area that we're gonna be adventuring in tonight. And lift off. All right, we are up in the sky. Oh man. You know what, there's like all kinds of clouds coming in right now. This actually looks gorgeous, check that out. So glass frogs, an arboreal frog that lives up off the ground, love river systems because that's where they lay their eggs and develop their tadpoles. Now, if we can locate water, there's a pretty good chance that we could put ourselves there, and listen for the calls of the glass frog, and then locate the ghost glass frog. Okay, I'm gonna fly due east, and we wanna mark the ridges and the approximate distance to get to these streams and rivers, and hopefully get eyes on one of the streams that's closest to us as a starting point, and we want to maybe sketch the shape and some distinct features sure. to help us get there. Okay. So you see the ridge right in front of us, that's, we'll call that ridge one, and there's definitely a secondary ridge over top of it. Okay. And this is the great part about scouting with the drone. You really can see the topography in an area like Costa Rica, which is very mountainous and hilly, and just confusing at night. I mean, right, Mario, you can easily yeah. get turned around out there in the jungle, but by having a map at our aid, it's going to make tonight's expedition that much more efficient. This vegetation is dense. Even from the sky, it is difficult to see anything in those trees. That's water, got it. So you see the way that curves around? So yep. over ridge one, and then on the downside of ridge two, the stream comes from the south and goes just north and then bends back west. Yep. And then you see that cluster of rocks? Yep. I think that could be our uh, kind of landmark, maybe our entryway. Based on the fact that that was over 2,500 meters of flight, we're going to estimate to get down here because of the terrain up and down, that's going to be about another two kilometers. Okay. Three kilometers total in hiking tonight. Okay. And then you have a compass on your watch, which will really come in handy. Yep. So we've got the map. We know where the stream is at. All we gotta do is wait until it gets dark. And of course, bring that drone back. I hear it. There it is, yeah. So we did a manned launch, and right now we're going to do a catch landing. This is not for a novice drone pilot. Gotcha. All right, well, that's a wrap on recon. Let's head back and wait for darkness. As you can see, night has descended upon us, and it's time to search the rainforest for the ghost glass frog. Let's turn our headlamps on and hit the trail. I'm scanning around, I'm listening. I do hear something coming from over here. 
I think I hear a call. Hear that? It's coming from right up here. Let's check this out. Oh, yep, right there. Look at that. Our first glass frog, cool. Now, first things first, I'm just gonna leave it alone for a second so I can get my hands wet. I don't wanna handle a frog with dry hands. Let me see if I can get this frog off its perch. Come here, little guy. Perfect. There we go. Okay. This is not the Elix or the ghost glass frog, but it's actually one of the smallest species of glass frog here in Costa Rica, and it's the Spinosa glass frog otherwise known as the dwarf glass frog. One of the first distinct characteristics you will notice about the glass frog is besides being that really cool translucent green is their eyes are actually set forward as opposed to the side like we'd see in a red eye leaf frog or some of the other frogs that we have here in Costa Rica. And that forward set eye pattern is what gives them that really cool Kermit the Frog look that they're so famous for. I think we've had it off his leaf for long enough. Let's put it back and keep searching. We've got a long night ahead of us if we're gonna find that ghost. We've gone about a kilometer east so far, and we know our final destination or the water source that we're looking for is about three kilometers east. Looks like we need to go a little northeast. Mario, you seeing that? Yep, according to my compass on my watch, yeah, if we go in this direction, it'll be kind of slightly northeast, and then okay. uh, I think we'll get on that eastern trail as well. It's funny, when you first step foot off trail, there's always this sensation that comes over you. It's just like a heightened awareness. Walking on the trail feels safe walking off the trail feels hazardous just by nature. So you tend to move a little bit more deliberately and you just, you see more. It's, it's really a, uh, an awesome thing to get off trail. You've got a little bit of groundwater starting here. That means the bigger stream is definitely nearby. Let's head on up here and get to the start of the stream. <gasps> Dude, Fertilance. Where? Huge. Let me see. Holy smokes. Look at his head. Whoa. Oh my God. Whew. That is a formidable snake right there. Good spot, Mario. Do you want the snake hook? Uh, no, I don't think we're gonna mess with it. Just gonna get a nice shot of it. So the Fertilance relies on its cryptic coloration to blend into the environment. And an animal in this position could stay in wait for hours without moving a single muscle. The name of the game is waiting when you are an ambush predator. And a snake like this has all the time in the world to wait for an unsuspecting prey item. That is exactly why you have to watch every single step you take out here because your next step could be on something like that fair to lance. And that'd be a very bad day for us. It looks like it's flattening out a little bit, which is good news for us. We can really start looking. I just heard a glass frog, guys, up this way. It's a very quick chirp. It's like a <whistles> Hear that? <whistles> oh, guys, we got one. Yes! Oh, man, I knew I heard one. All right, here we go. Hands wet. Going to gently take it off the leaf. I am so excited to show you this frog, and you're going to see why we came all this way to show you the ghost of the rainforest, the ghost glass frog. How cool are those eyes? So cryptic and so unique. In my opinion, this frog has the coolest eyes in all of frogs in Central and South America. We're gonna break out the lights, we're gonna break out the macro lens, and we're gonna bring you in close so you can get a good look at why this frog is so special. Mario, you got that macro lens ready to go? Yep, got the lens and the EOS R on the tripod. And I've got the ghost glass frog. Oh, looking right at you. I think it sees its reflection in your lens area. It's like, who's that? That looks like me. Hey, buddy. Let me help you there, Mario. Okay, back it up just a little bit right there. Trying to remain as still as I possibly can for Mario's shot right now so everyone at home can see those magnificent eyes. They look cool? Yeah, they're kind of um, reticulated. They got this pattern on them. I'm gonna pause there. Let's try to get a different angle on them. Okay, let me 
just carefully nudge it. This How's way. it doing? Is it doing good? Oh my goodness. That's frog. good. Let's, oh, that's let's, cool let's get right that. Let's get its little pads. Yeah. So this species does not have a completely transparent ventrum. However, I could see a little bit of the white sheath of intestinal track inside of its stomach. And I could actually see like the beating of the heart. I'm glad you brought that up, Mario, because a lot of people think that all glass frogs have a completely transparent stomach, and that is not true. In fact, it is more of the exception than the rule when that does occur. Now, if you have seen our previous glass frog episode, that was a species with a completely clear ventral side where you could actually see the heart beating and the blood flowing through the frog, which was pretty amazing. Another cool thing about the ghost glass frog it is actually the largest species of glass frog in Costa Rica. So kind of fitting that we started tonight with the dwarf glass frog or the spinosa, which is the smallest, and we land on the ghost glass frog, which is the biggest, but still pretty small. It's winking at you. I think he just complimented you, Mario. He's like, wink, that's a great shot. Well, I hope you see now why it was worth the effort to come all the way down here to find the ghost of the rainforest, the ghost glass frog. And I do wanna give a special thank you to our friends at b &H Photo for sponsoring this episode and putting together a number of amazing deal packages for everybody at home. So if you go to www.bhphoto.com forward slash brave right now, you can take advantage of those exclusive offers. All right, let's put this guy back on his leaf and head home. Over the years, Brave Wilderness has shown you some pretty strange oddities of the animal world. We've seen tiny anteaters, worms that bite, worms that aren't even worms at all. How about those giant salamanders? And we've even shown you frogs with transparent skin. But the one I'm going to show you today is both bizarre in appearance and has one of the weirdest traits I've ever heard of or should I say smelled of. Get your popcorn ready. This one is unbelievable. What's going on everybody? I'm Mark Vins and welcome back for another adventure here at the Wildlife HQ in Sunshine Coast, Australia. And we're here again today with Sue. And Sue, I see you have some bananas that we're going to use to feature our next guest. Yes, this is his favorite food, but most people have probably never heard of his species before. Okay, and what is his species? So they're known as a binturong, um, or their common name is a bear cat, but Ooh. they're not a bear and they're not a cat. Okay, cool. I like the name bear cat. That's already piqued my interest right there. I'm gonna use a GoPro to try to see how close I can actually get, but you feel good about this? Yes, let's go. Okay, let's go find a bear cat. <laughs> To encounter a bear cat in the wild is extremely rare, as they have become vulnerable and even endangered in much of their natural range in Southeast Asia. This is unfortunately due to poaching and habitat loss. Looks like Sari has caught wind of the bananas. Yeah, it's looking pretty good here. He's having a big stretch. Come Are on. bear cats traditionally a nocturnal species? Mostly nocturnal, so not strictly, but mostly. Okay. This bear cat reminds me of a wolverine. And the wolverine we've worked with in Alaska was not nearly this calm. So I'm hoping that Sari stays in this demeanor for the entirety of this episode. He's actually a gentle giant. Okay, good. They definitely look a little bit intimidating, I will say. Look at those claws. Check out that big tail. His tail is actually fully prehensile and he can suspend his whole weight by the very tip of his tail. Hey, sorry. Hi. Look at that. Yum. Yum. Oh, yeah. How's that? That's just how, ooh, ugh. That's how I eat a banana. You are slobbering all over me. But thank you for coming down to hang out. You are very interesting. Oh, look at that claw. Look at, what's another bite? Oh my goodness. So I'm able to get a good look at these claws and they are razor sharp, no doubt for climbing trees but the pads are almost like a bear. I could definitely see why they get the name Bearcat. Not only are they absolutely covered in this fluffy mane, but also their claws and pads are just like a black bear. Look at you, hi, how's it going? And you can see the, the cat comes from the whiskers. So to clear things up, let's talk about this name Bearcat. 
While possessing bear-like feet and cat-like whiskers, a binturong is not related to a bear or a cat. In fact, its family, Viveridae, contains many other unusual small to medium-sized mammals, like the civet. But this omnivorous bear cat is the largest, and although it looks an awful lot like a wolverine or a badger, it's not closely related to them either. Now, how old will a bear cat live? Uh, so up to about 25 years. Okay, and how old is, sorry if you don't uh, mind me asking, is that rude? Is that rude? Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't mind. Uh, he's about 11 years old. Okay, so the, the coloration, whoa, 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 see we got a little bit more left. Oh my <laughs> gosh. So the, the coloration in the fur, that has nothing to do with age? It doesn't, no. And they can vary in colour depending on what region they're found. Uh, so they can be really grey right through to the black. Very cool. Now while the hair does keep the bear cat warm, it also doubles as a natural raincoat, keeping the saboreal species dry up in the treetops. All right, we've got one last little piece, sorry. This is going to be it. This is the outro. You ready? Well, I hope you guys enjoyed hanging out with this bear cat as much as I did today. Thank you, Sue, so much. If you guys are ever in the Sunshine Coast of Australia, say hello to our friend, the Bearcat Sari. You won't be disappointed. Uh, we're about to leave and then I saw this. That's not rain, it's pee. And it smells just like popcorn. Oh my gosh. It's like all around us. <laughs> I cannot believe that. If you told me, hey, somebody's got a fresh bag of popcorn ready, I would believe you right now. Holy smokes. All right. Banana drop, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs>Never in my wildest dreams did I ever imagine feeding a bear cat. And who knew they liked bananas so much? But boy, the shocker of the century had to be this animal's unique and oddly familiar scent. While bear cats always smell subtly like corn chips because of their musk, their pee smells just like buttered popcorn. Not kind of like it, or somewhat like it. We're talking exactly like it. And this is due to the chemical compound in their urine known as 2-acetyl-1-pyrrolene, which is the same chemical compound created in the popcorn popping process when sugars and amino acids interact at high temperatures. Honestly, before today, if you were to tell me any animal's urine would smell exactly like my favorite snack food, my answer would be no way. But it does. Let's just say going to the movies will never be the same. Huge thanks goes out to Australia's Wildlife HQ. We love the HQ because they are a small family-owned wildlife park run by passionate conservationists who aid in important efforts, including the Queensland Koala Crusaders, a group in particular need at the moment as a result from the fires. Their support for conserving wildlife means that by paying a visit, you can both have the rare opportunity to get up close with some incredible creatures and conserve them all at the same time. Lizard. Lizard, right here. You guys rolling? Whoa, check that out. Look at that. This is a shingleback. Wow, what an amazingly cool lizard this is. Let me see if I can pick it up carefully. Oh, don't want to get bit. Don't want to get bit by this guy. Hang on. Look at that defensive display. Whoa, got a lunge. Oh, he is, he is a feisty one. Oh, oh do you hear that? You hear that hiss? Got him. All right. Here, let's come on in close, guys. That, that is a really good look at their defensive display. I was hoping we would come across one of these lizards here in Western Australia. And there it is, our first reptile of the trip, the shingleback, the first thing you notice about this animal is that tongue sticking out, flaring its tongue out saying, hey, I'm feisty and I will give you a tremendous bite if you get any closer. You can see the size of those mandibles and it does have razor sharp teeth. Let's talk about its name. The shingleback gets its name because of its armored plating. Look at those scales. They are raised up and very thick, like an armored little tank. Here, Andrew, like put your, feel the back of that. Whoa. He's super tough. He's super tough. An extra tough lizard that utilizes its scales to ward off predators. Those armored scales would act like a plate, a barrier, to hopefully protect it long enough to scurry away. Now, 
Some people would call this a shingleback, others would know it as a bobtail. It gets the name bobtail because of this little nubby tail on the back, which has a couple of purposes. The first purpose is it's a defense mechanism because it's a false head. So if there's a predator like a hawk or a snake that comes in and tries to eat this lizard, it might accidentally go for the wrong side because it looks a lot like its head. And that would be good for this lizard because it would give it a chance to get away. Now, another purpose for that bobtail is it's a fat store. Being out here in the desert, water is scarce and energy can be scarce. So certain times of the season, while this lizard can be hibernating, it relies on the fat stores in its tail to survive. Now, these lizards are a species of blue tongue skink. And while their tongue isn't as bright as their cousin, the Eastern blue tongue, I think their armored appearance makes them the coolest of these spunky Australian lizards. I want to be very clear. I do not want to take a bite from this lizard. It has very strong jaws because it is an omnivore. It feasts on a diet of snails and beetles, so it requires strong mandibles to crush those shells up. And I don't want you to crush my finger, right? Because we're going to be friends because I'm going to help you out too before the end of this video. These lizards can be found while road cruising out here in the outback. They are often victims of car strikes because they like to stay on the road to get warmth. They are ectothermic. So we're gonna help you cross the road, buddy, don't worry. But we're also gonna help you out with something else. Now, one of the things that we can do is to remove some of its parasites. You see that right there? Let's get a tight shot. These reptiles are known to be covered in ticks. So anytime we encounter an animal with visible parasites like leeches, barnacles or ticks, we always do our best to try to remove them if possible. In this case, removing these pesky blood suckers will cause no pain to the lizard and will certainly help its chances for survival in this harsh desert environment. This is a little bit risky right here. Getting my fingers super close to those jaws. Got him. Oh, oh no. There's more. Oh. Hang on, buddy. We'll help you out here. Ugh, oh, guys, there are so many ticks on this lizard. That one was in its left ear, and the ticks do like to go for the softer part, so ears and in between the scales. I'm gonna try to try this one out. Here we go, yeah. Gotcha, there we go. And there is another tick, see? That's what friends do, we remove ticks from each other's ears. You would do the same for me, wouldn't you? Now this is not a tick that would burrow into a human, but they can actually get about 20 times this size by engorging themselves with the blood of these reptiles. I've actually found a tick on another shingleback before that was the size of a grape. Ugh, disgusting, right? Ugh, we don't want ticks. I think I got the main ticks off of you. Got him, got him. They are all stuffed in his ear. How did you get so many ticks inside your ear? Oh gosh, guys, there are so many ticks in this lizard's ear. You guys are gonna wanna get a shot of this, it's close. Ugh, look at that. Dude, where have you been? No more ticks. I think I got them all out of that ear. I'm sure that feels a lot better, huh, buddy? Now you can hear again. All right, the sun's coming back out. He's getting a little feisty. Uh, let's see if we can get another look at that iconic defense display, that tongue bleh, splaying out to warn any predator off. All right, I'm gonna try to put him down carefully, and not take a bite. Ready? You guys got your shot? One, two, three. See that? See that? See that defense display? Oh, he is fast. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're still friends, don't worry. Oh. Looks angry. oh man, they are feisty when they want to be. Oh, not messing around, are you, buddy? Ah, too close. Gosh, you bit down hard. Oh, guys, look at that bite. We're trying to get the thumbnail and I was using my hat to shade, and he's totally bit my hat. Oh my gosh, it is strong. I don't think it's gonna let go. You would not want to take a bite from this lizard. Holy smokes, it is just bulldog grip. Let's see if I can just put it down if it'll let go. 
give me my hat. Who do you think you are, Jake Paul? Got my hat? Can I have my hat back, sir? Please? Are you kidding me? Thank you. Thank you for my hat back. Okay. Wow. You would not want to take a bite from this lizard. It is a bulldog. That is a bite that you would not soon forget. So cool. Out here in Western Australia in our first encounter with the shingleback. I'm Mark Vins. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right. Let's put this one across the road and continue on our way.